Okay, so we're going to start with cyclophosphamide as an example of bifunctional nitrogen mustard moiety, um, which is the main mechanism of action for our alkylating agents. <clears throat> so we're going to start here, and that's really going to lead the way as far as how all of our nitrogen mustard or alkylating agents are working. So a little interesting backstory, if you care, is that um, the nitrogen mustards, the alkylating agents, were discovered as a treatment for non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because after World War I, when mustard gas, an alkylating agent, was used extensively um, in the war, and lots of soldiers were exposed to it, two doctors from Yale discovered that uh, it caused a decrease in uh, lymphocytes. And so that it has um, a specificity, it has a, an attraction to, it, to B cells particularly. So mustard gas, very, very awful, terrible thing. But we did get an antineoplastic out of it, so we've got that going for us. One of the things, too, is in case anybody was wondering, uh, your mustard gas is not related at all to the mustard in your fridge that you put on your bratwurst. It is that name, mustard gas, came from the smell. It's a very peppery, strong smell of mustard gas, and that's where they got the name from. So interesting. World War I war facts, along with your studying. So cyclophosphamide. Cyclophosphamide, the important thing to remember here is that it must be biotransformed before it is active. It must be biotransformed into an active metabolite in order for it to have the cytotoxic effects that we're looking for. So it is biotransformed by cytochrome P450. Not that surprising, right? P450 is involved in approximately 75% of all drug metabolism. It's well absorbed through the PO route. Bioavailability is nearly 90%, which is great. So we can just give it in the um, oral route. And then we've got about 60% of the active metabolite is going to be bound to plasma protein. So what you're going to have happen is 90% of the drug is going to be absorbed through the PO route. It's going to have that first pass effect to the liver where cytochrome P450 is going to convert it into active metabolites. 60% of those active metabolites, however, are going to be bound to plasma protein. Of course, when we are talking about people with cancer, depending on the type of cancer, they may have issues with hypoalbuminemia. So it is something that you want to keep in mind, is that it may have more cytotoxic effects. It may have a higher dosage that's actually in the um, VD space, that volume of distribution space, like actually at the cell rather than in the blood. So we do want to keep track of that. All right, so this is kind of our pathway here of how we're going to go from the drug formulation. We've got our cyclophosphamide in its oral formulation and how it's going to get down very generally to killing off cells. So first we've got our cyclophosphamide at the top and we're going to remember that 90% of that is absorbed through the GI. So we've got it going and it's heading to the liver. At the liver, under this first pass effect, it's going to go under microsomial oxidation. We don't need to know what the difference between microsomial and enzymatic is per se, but you do need to know that we're going to add this hydroxy group onto it. We're going to get 4-hydroxycyclophosphamide. We've got that hydroxy right there, chilling out. And we're going into systemic circulation from there. Now we're going into active metabolites. And what's going to happen is that 4-hydroxycyclophosphamide undergoes non-enzymatic breakdown to cytox cytotoxic metabolites. So that hydroxycyclophosphamide converts into an aldehyde, um, it is isomerizes into an aldehyde, and then breaks apart into acrolein and phosphoramide mustard. Acrolein is a highly reactive cytotoxic molecule, and 
the phosphoramide mustard is going to be the active alkylating agent that is going to um, induce the cytotoxic effects that were our main mechanism of action here. But acrolein is also cytotoxic. It is also highly reactive, which we'll see when we talk about side effects of cyclophosphamide. From there, also the aldehyde from this hydroxycyclophosphamide is going to make its way back through the circulation to the liver, where it's going to undergo enzymatic breakdown into inactive metabolites and be excreted. So what do we need to start off a nice strong alkylating reaction with our nitrogen mustards that is going to cause the desired apoptosis, that desired killing off of tumor cells. You need not one, but two guanine base pairs. We've got our two guanine base pairs. They can be on the same strand or on opposite strands. We just need two base pairs relatively close to each other. Our alkylating, our active metabolite, the phosphoramide mustard, the alkylating agent here, is going to come in and bond to a nitrogen on the guanine base and the nitrogen on the other guanine base. That's the N7 spot. And it's going to make a covalent bond. It's going to be a strong bond that's difficult to break apart. It's not going anywhere. We're making a covalent bond at N7 on each guanine base, and it's sticking. Then what happens? Along comes P53, and P53 is our tumor protein, which if you'll remember from studying the, you know, mechanisms of cellular division and DNA division or replication is P53 is coming through and checking the DNA for transcription errors and checking the DNA for anything that's not right, and it's going to stop cellular reproduction, it's going to induce cell death, it's going to induce cell repair or DNA repair depending on what it finds and how it reacts to the situation. In this situation it is going to see these two guanine bases with this alkylating molecule bridging the two of them and it's going to be like what the heck is going on? We can't have this. This is not how the DNA is supposed to work. I've got this bridge covalently bonded, I can't break it apart, and it's going to say light everything on fire, kill the cell, which is what it'll do. You'll have a break in the DNA strand and subsequent apoptosis of the cell. This is obviously nonspecific, so it's going to do that with our tumor cells, and it's going to do that with our um, host cells, our healthy cells as well. Also, this is not cycle-specific. So we do not have to have something that is in any specific part of the reproduction cycle or cell cycle in order for this meant to work. It's not cycle specific. It is a very broad um, anti-neoplastic. So it can be given alone. It is going to just start killing off cells. So again, we said, you know, it was first initially developed because we had the non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and it was, uh, those soldiers were showing decreased lymphocytes, and, um, and we said, oh, hey, look, it works for lymphoma, it also worked for breast and ovarian cancer, testicular cancer, just a whole bunch of stuff, non-cycle specific, non-cellular specific, it's just going to kill everything. So, which is part of the problem, is that it is so cytotoxic, that one of the things with cyclophosphamide is that it is, it is linked to hemorrhagic cystitis. Hemorrhagic cystitis in relation to therapy with cyclophosphamide is driven by that acrolein metabolite. So if you remember, we go back, the main alkylating mechanism here is with the one metabolite, the phosphoramide mustard, and we, but we also have the acrolein metabolite floating around throughout the body, also being cytotoxic and very reactive. It is electrophilic. It's going to steal all your electrons. It is going up 
to all your thiols and stealing your electrons. So it is a Lewis acid because it's an electron steal. So it's stealing electrons from molecules that are designed to protect to designed to protect and stabilize DNA and proteins, including our cysteine. So our cysteine, if you remember your biochem, is going to be important in protein folding and also protein stabilization as it moves into um, extracellular spaces. So particularly with extracellular proteins, cysteine is going to be a big part of stabilizing that protein and um, working with it, like keeping its structure. So the same mechanism of the acrylate metabolite, this very reactive and also cytotoxic mechanism is what is causing the cyclophosphamide associated bladder cancers. So the other thing that we're looking out for, not, not just the hemorrhagic cystitis, but secondary um, bladder cancer associated with um, therapy with cyclophosphamides. So how are we preventing this, the hemorrhagic cystitis? We're going to do aggressive hydration, and we are also going to give a drug called Mesna. Mesna is, as you can see here, has got this nice sulfur group on the end there. And if you look, it's also on our cysteine molecule as well. So what's going to happen is our acrylate metabolite is going to have more places to bond to, and so it's less likely to bond to the cysteine. Also with the aggressive hydration is that we're tying up this acrylate metabolite that's electrophilic with this polar molecule, the water, and hopefully going to flush it out of the bladder. Right? So we want regular flushing out of the bladder, plus we're going to keep some of that acrylate metabolite occupied with the Mesna drug. All right, so let's go through this one more time so we can get a good look at that um, alkylate and base pair. You've got one, two guanine bases. Our phosphoramide mustard or any of our nitrogen mustards are going to come through and they've got those two functional sites, right? They have two functional sites. That's how it's making this al alkylating bond across the DNA as it makes this covalent bond across the DNA. P53 is going to come through. See that the DNA is gotten all jacked up by our phosphoramide mustard, and it's going to say, nope, kill them all. Kill them all. We just can't have this going on. And so it will kill our tumor cells. And like we said, non-cycle specific, so we can really kill those tumor cells.